This lecture is on Newton's laws. Uh, we're going to take a look at Newton's laws. Newton, more than any other person in this class, is responsible for the material you're going to learn. In fact, a lot of times this class is actually called uh, Newtonian uh, kinematics. So, or excuse me, Newtonian physics. So you're going to use Newton's laws quite a bit in this class, and he did make some other significant contributions to this class as well. So. If we take a look, it says, if you've seen further, if I've seen further, it's because I've been standing on the shoulders of giants. It's a famous quote of Isaac Newton. So the goals for this particular lecture are that you be able to describe and give examples of Newton's laws of motion. There are lots of conceptual type questions for the test. There are going to be things like, hey, if you push this with this much force, which direction is it going to move? Or what is the reaction force here? So there's a lot of conceptual questions that end up being uh, on the test about Newton's laws of motion. So it's very important that you not be, be able to calculate, but you also be able to be able to give examples and describe them. You need to be able to distinguish between mass and weight. And that's a really, really, really huge one for this unit. For some reason, people always think that mass and weight are, are the same things. And that's because they're used interchangeably based on um, everyday language, but they are very, very, very different. And then you need to be able to use the equation F net equals M A. Now this is the most commonly used equation on the tax and probably on the star as well because the sum of the forces is going to equal the mass times the acceleration is kind of the basis of everything we're going to learn this year. So now in the explorer thing, in the engage activity where you built a balloon rocket and you were able to describe the motion of the balloon rocket. We said if you set the balloon up this way, what would happen is the balloon would actually move this way. But why did the balloon move that way? And it turns out that the reason why the balloon moved that way is because you had air that came out the back. And that air that came out of the back actually propelled the, the balloon forward. Now, there's a couple of factors that we can look at in terms of the balloon and, and why it moves and what it did. So the balloon rocket actually continued to move forward even when it ran out of air. So actually this, when this balloon was completely and totally deflated, it continued to move on its path for at least a brief while. Now there are some exce exceptions to this. Uh, let's say that you had the balloon actually traveling upward, then the balloon actually ran out of, ga ran out of gas and then fell back down. But as long as you had a straight line, the balloon would continue in the same direction. Now, what is a possible explanation for this? A possible explanation also you can use as far as your car is concerned. If your car runs out of gas, the engine comes to a stop. That doesn't mean you immediately come to a stop. It turns out that there's um, we have to look at it in terms of Newton's laws of motion. So before we get into Newton's laws of motion, we actually want to take a look at what came before Newton. And that was Aristotle's uh, laws of motion. Now it's really, 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 really important that you realize that New that Aristotle's laws of motion are in fact incorrect. It is not correct. It's not valid. But what Aristotle said was that, okay, every object seeks its natural place. In other words, uh, a rock belongs on the ground. And so if you take the rock and you put it above the ground, then the, then the rock will seek its natural place. So it will move in the direction of its natural place. Um, there was a way to move the rock away from the ground, but in order to do that, you had to exert something called violent motion. So that was just taking and removing something from its actual natural place. And this is kind of the key idea right here as far as Aristotle is concerned. And it's this idea that the speed of an object is directly proportional to the force exerted on it. In other words, the f more you push on an object, the faster it moves. And that makes sense to some degree, okay? If you push something really, really hard, it ends up moving so faster than if you uh, don't push it very much at all. So Aristotle, his ideas were around for almost 2,000 years in terms of being considered to be the most accurate way of looking at the world. But along comes Newton. And Newton didn't work in a vacuum. If you look at that quote, he built, he was on the shoulders of giants, he built on the work of Galileo. Galileo was a very, very famous scientist that we'll talk about later. He did uh, lots and lots of experiments with ramps and acceleration and things like that. But it really came down to Newton to describe these laws of motions. In fact, that's why this class is called Newtonian Physics. Newton was the prime contributor in that case. Not only did Newton contribute to these laws of motion, but he was actually uh, came up with significant advances in optics, his laws of motion, gravity, calculus, fluid mechanics, 
Um, he was a famous alchemist. He was also somebody who actually printed the money and came up with different ways to, to, uh, to combat counterfeiting in England. So let's look at Newton's laws of motion. Now the first law of motion, okay, this is called the first law of motion or Newton's first law, okay, is the law of inertia. And it's pretty simple. It just says an object at rest will stay at rest unless acted on by a net external force. So unless something comes around and pushes this ball, the ball will stay in place forever. And now people usually can agree with that for the most part, but usually you have some people who say, but wait a second, what if instead of the ball being on a ramp, or excuse me, on a flat surface, what if it's on a ramp? Okay, as we'll learn later, whenever it's on a ramp, what that means is there is actually an external force that actually makes the ball move. So Newton's first law, part one, just basically says an object at rest will stay at rest unless acted on by a net external force. And it can be simplified in the ways objects like to be lazy. They don't want to move unless something pushes them. The second part of the law of inertia, so this is still Newton's first law, says that an object in motion will stay in motion unless acted on by a net external force. And people usually have kind of a problem with this because they say, okay, well I take this ball and the ball is rolling along the floor and eventually it comes to a stop. It doesn't continue forever. Well, we'll learn about a little bit later that there is actually a net external force that's acting on the ball and you may be familiar with this. If you take this ball and you roll it on a smooth floor like tile, it continues to go a lot further than if it was made out of something like carpet. So we can say that the surface itself has something to do with slowing the ball down. Well, since it's something outside of the ball itself, that is an external factor. So an object in motion will stay in motion unless acted on by a net external force. In other words, objects do not like to change. This goes back to the whole lazy thing. They, don't, they want to act how they act. All right, so this brings in an interesting discussion of math. mass versus weight. Mass is a measurement of inertia. In other words, how much objects like to resist a change in motion. Now, mass is measured with a balance. And the standard unit is the kilogram. Now, this is the biggest problem that people have is they are so used to using grams in chemistry and they get to physics and they say, wait a second, the standard unit is the kilogram? According to the SI unit, the kilogram is the standard. In chemistry, they don't like to use the kilogram so much because they tend to deal with very, very small things. But the standard unit is still the kilogram. To go from grams to kilograms, you take grams and you divide by a thousand. Now, mass is very, very, very different from force. A force is a push or a pull that can, resu that can result, doesn't necessarily have to, but it can result in a change in the object's motion, direction, or shape. And you generally measure force with something called a spring scale. And you actually used a spring scale in the weight versus mass lab. So you looked at what the mass was, you looked at what the weight was, and this, the weight in this particular case was an example of a force. So weight is a force. So because of that, it's measuring the unit of the newton. So we come to our example. Our first example wants us to compare and contrast uh, mass and force, and specifically we're going to say weight. And generally, what we want to do is we want to say, okay, mass is generally represented in kilograms, force is measured in newtons. We want to say that mass is signified by an m, while force is, is a fg. Now, we also want to know what else is you know, similar and different. Well, the similar things is they're usually both the stuff. So as something gets bigger, it goes up. And smaller, it goes down. They go up together, they go down together. But really, that's all that's the same. One goes up, one goes down. Mass is the amount of stuff. While force, this weight, is the attraction between masses. So, in order for you to have weight, you have to have two masses. It's the attraction between two masses. Okay, 
this weight is a force and mass is the amount of stuff. This mass is the same everywhere. Okay, if you were going to go to the moon, your mass would be the same. If you were to go to the moon, your weight would be very drastically different. And the reason for that is it's an attraction between two different masses. Well, guess what? If, that, if one of those masses changes, like say going from Earth to Jupiter, your mass is going to, or your weight is going to, is going to be dramatically increased at the same time your mass is going to stay the same. Same thing, if you go from Earth to outer space, your weight is going to go basically to zero while your mass is going to remain the same number. Alright, this question says, a rock is attached to a string and swung in a circle as shown below. What direction will the rock fly if the rope is suddenly cut? So if we were to take a look at this, we know that the object is moving in a circular path. Now, you may have done this if you were to let go of the rock, the rock doesn't continue to move in a circle. It doesn't go straight out like this. Instead, at every single point that the object is moving in a circle, it's moving in a tangent line. So that is the velocity at any given point, is tangent to the circular path. When you cut the string, that removes the force. So the force is now zero. Well, if the force is zero, you should be able to go ahead and determine the direction that the rock will fly at this point. This says, the question says, which object has greater inertia, a car moving down the highway or a cruise ship at rest? The correct answer is this, and you should be able to justify that with the previous notes. Now, in the weight versus mass lab, we actually explored this relationship between force and mass, and we said, okay, we put force right here, and then we put mass right here, and we said, okay, if you put force and mass right there and you graph the two, you got the same number every time. And that same number was actually g. So we can actually take this equation and we can use it to introduce Newton's second law. And Newton's second law basically says that there is a relationship between force, mass, and acceleration. In other words, the more you push something with, okay, in other words, the more force you have, so we're going from a small force to a bigger force, the more force results in an equal, accel or equal increase in acceleration. In other words, force is directly proportional to acceleration. If you double the force, you double the acceleration. If you half the force, you half the acceleration. Newton's second law also says that force is inversely proportional to acceleration. In other words, if you have the same force exerted on two different masses, well, the acceleration of this one is going to be greater than the acceleration of this one. And the reason why is you're pushing something with much, much more mass. Think of pushing a toy car versus pushing a real car. If you push them with the same force, their motion is going to be very, very, very different. What this says is force is inversely proportional to acceleration. So what that means is, let's just say mass is inversely proportional to acceleration. And what that means is as the mass increases, the acceleration decreases. Now we're assuming that the force is the same. Okay, those two forces are equal. So mass is inversely proportional to acceleration. And we can take those two parts of Newton's second law and we can combine them into the equation we talked about in our learning rules. And that is this. The net force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. Now, this uh, right here, we described the variables at each point. We said this was the net force or total force. And we'll talk more about that in our next lecture, but it's very, very important. This right here is the push or pull capable of changing the motion direction. It is measured in the SI unit of the Newton with the spring scale. Acceleration, that's the same acceleration we talked about in kinematics. It is the rate of change in velocity. And it has a unit of the meter per second squared. It is measured with an accelerometer, or you can use a pair of photo gates and a ruler. Next, you have mass, which is also new this unit, which is a measure of the amount of matter in kilograms. And you can use a triple beam or electronic balance. Now, if you were to take a look at this, you may say, okay, well, how does that work as far as the units are concerned? Because Force right here is measured in newtons, mass is in kilograms, and then acceleration is in meters per second squared. That doesn't look like they match up because here you have a newton and here you have a kilogram meter per second squared. Actually, one newton is defined as one kilogram meter per second squared. So although they look very different, they are the same thing. It's just a shorter way of, of expressing what that.
So we come to example B1. It says a 10 kilogram box is accelerating using a force of F. A 40 kilogram box is accelerating using the same force of F. It says what is the ratio of the accelerations of the box? Okay, so in this recording, we said that there's a force of F exerted on a 10 kilogram box and a 40 kilogram box. And we want to know what the ratio of the accelerations are. So we're going to take a look at here at the given information. And the given information that we do have is, number one, that the forces that are exerted on them are the same. So we have equal forces that are exerted on both of these particular objects. So now we also know that the mass of the first object is 10 kilograms. And we know that the mass of the second object is 40 kilograms. And what we want to know is what is the relationship between the accelerations? What is the ratio? In other words, what is the acceleration of the first box divided by the acceleration of the second box, or the ratio of the accelerations? So the principle that's involved here is if you look at it, we're relating F, M, and A. So that is clearly Newton's second law. And so now we can use our formula. And our formula for Newton's second law is F equals M, A. There's no irrelevant information here because, look, I've got F's, M, and I'm trying to solve for A. Everything's accounted for in this particular formula. So now we can look at our given information. So you have the forces are equal to each other. What that means is that the force of one is the force of the other. Or in other words, the mass times the acceleration of the first block equals the mass acceleration of the second block. Okay, Because the two forces were equal. So now you can actually plug in your numbers. You can say, okay, 10 times A1 equals 40 times A2. Well, now you can divide both sides by A2 and then divide both sides by 10. When you do that, the 10 is going to cross out over here. The A2 is going to cross over here. And what you're going to be left with is a1 over A2 is equal to 40 over 10, or 4. So that's the relation. This one says determine the mass of the object based on the experimental data. So now we want to take a look at this. Remember, we've got acceleration here and force here. Now that's very different than what we had on our previous uh, graph, the graph that we did before. So if you look, if I were to find the slope of this graph, the slope would give me acceleration divided by force. Now compare that to F equals MA. If you're trying to solve for the mass there, you would get F M equals F over A. So you should be able to figure out how to flip between that and that and solve for the mass of this particular object. This question says, a 1,000 kilogram car is towed with a chain capable of exerting 4,000 newtons and not braking. What is the maximum acceleration of the car without breaking the chain? You should be able to solve this without, um, without any help. The answer that you should get is 4 meters per second. And it's up to you to be able to show your work on how to get there. The next question says that an individual states that they weigh 60 kilograms. Without a scale, explain how you know for a fact that they do not. And the reason for that is, is 60 kilograms is a unit of mass, whereas they say they weigh 60 kilograms. Weight does not equal mass, and that is very, very, very important. They are not the same thing. What is the mass of a person with a weight of 465 newtons? So you take a look at it and say, all right, you should be able to say force equals mass times acceleration. We know that the force goes here. And we know that the acceleration, whenever you calculate somebody's weight, is g, or 9.8 meters per second squared. So in the, balloon, excuse me, in the balloon rockets lab, we said, what is the force that pushed the balloon to the right? We said, okay, well, we know the balloon moves to the right. We talked about that explicitly. But we said, okay, really what happens is you've got this gas that's being pushed out to the left. And so there's a force that pushes the air this way, but there's no explicit force that actually moves the balloon in the direction that it travels. 
So the question is, is why does the balloon move to the right? And the reason for that is Newton's final law of motion. His final law of motion states uh, that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction force. This equal and opposite reaction force can be defined by the FA, which is the action force, is equal to negative FR, which is the reaction force. This is Newton's final law of motion. So if we go back to our balloon rockets example, the force exerted on the gas pushing this way has an equal force that propels the balloon in the opposite direction. Just so you know, the action-reaction force are always on different objects. Okay, they actually are never exerted on the same object. So it says a, a 25 kilogram boy pushes his 100 kilogram dad with a force of 20 newtons on the pond shown below. What is the acceleration of each? So if you were to take a look at it, you can so the skydiver, skydiver jumps out of a plane and is pulled towards the earth. What is the opposing force? So here, we've got a man who's above the surface of the earth, and he's falling. There's a gravitational force that pulls him towards the earth. Well, it says for every force, there's an equal and opposite force. So what's the opposing force? It turns out there's actually a gravitational force that you exert on the earth, pulling the earth up slightly. Now, the reason why there's no way to detect this is because the mass of the earth is so much greater than your mass that even if you have all, what, 8 billion people on the earth and you put them all in the same location, you still aren't going to move the earth but maybe one atom. The mass of the earth is just that huge. Since a rocket is launched upward with a force of 100 newtons, what is the force that is exerted on the gas escaping the rocket? And you can say, okay, I will tell you the answer is negative 100 newtons. And you should be able to come to that answer and explain why that is the answer using your notes.